Good afternoon. Um, welcome uh, to today's uh, lecture. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Jonathan Adler. I'm a professor here at the law school. I direct the Center for Business Law and Regulation, which is sponsoring today's talk. Uh, it's really my pleasure today to be able to introduce to you uh, Susan Dudley, who is going to be talking on the question of whether the Trump administration is deconstructing the administrative state. As some of you may recall, uh, Trump's strategist Stephen Bannon gave an interview where he said that the deconstruction of the administrative state was one of the primary policy goals of the Trump administration, or would be one of the primary policy goals of the Trump administration. The Trump administration certainly has been very active in trying to push an, or an agenda of deregulation, and one of our questions today is whether or not they have been successful, and if so, in what ways, and if not, uh, why would that would be? And I can't think of anyone better to address this topic uh, than our speaker today, Susan Dudley. Uh, Susan has been an economist within the regulatory state at agencies like the Environmental Protection Agency and the Commodity Futures Trading Commission. She ran the regulatory studies program at the Mercatus Center, and, perhaps, and currently runs the regulatory studies program at George Washington University, where she also teaches in the Trachtenberg School. And perhaps most importantly, from 2007 to 2009, she served as our nation's regulatory czar, the informal name we give to the position of administrator of the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs within the Office of Management and Budget, the office that oversees regulatory policy for the executive branch reviews regulatory proposals from federal agencies before they are promulgated and plays a key role in determining whether regulatory agencies are acting both lawfully and consistent with the policy priorities of the executive branch. So since you didn't come here to listen to me, without any further ado, I will turn the podium over uh, to Susan Dudley. Susan. Thank you. You may not have come to listen to him, but I suggest that he actually w might be as much of an expert on this topic. So, um, so yes, Jonathan asked me to talk about whether Trump is deconstructing the administrative state. Um, let's see if I can get my... So he, has, he, he says he is. So this was a claim he made last fall. He says what they're doing is a historic effort to reduce job-killing regulations, that they've set a record on killing regulations, that no other administration has knocked out as many as they have, um, that they have a long way to go. But then a little bit later, he said, I think within a period of about another year, we'll have done everything that we need to do. So what I would like to talk to you about is, one, is he deconstructing or deregulating? Two, is it historic? And three, what should we expect in the longer term? Oh, yeah, so this was October when he made those statements. So um, by any measure, he actually has been issuing fewer new regulations. So I have a few of these statistics up here. The, this first one is number of pages in the Federal Register. So that's the compendium of um, proposed, uh, proposed and final new regulations being issued each year. So um, in his first two years, you can see his are the red bars, he issued 20,000 fewer than were issued during the first, uh, fewer pages, that is, than during the first two years of the Obama administration, and 11,000 fewer pages fewer than the beginning of the Bush administration. If you look at number of regulations issued in the first two years, again, a significant drop, um, a little over 4,000 rules compared to about 7,000 in the Bush and the Obama administrations. Of those, not all of them are big ticket items, but regulations are considered major if they're major or economically significant if they have impacts of 100 million or more in a year. And this final chart, um, I should be pointing this way, shouldn't you? I see it over there, but you're looking at it here. Um, is um, shows you the number of new economically significant or major regulations, 57 compared to 71 in the Bush administration and 127 in the Obama administration. So I'm comparing the first two years of each of them. And then I have one more slide on this. These are 
This looks at economically significant rules just across administrations going back to Reagan. And you can see there really is a dramatic reduction in, in the new regulatory activity. This chart excludes the independent regulatory agencies. So for example, it wouldn't have um, the Federal Communications Commission's net neutrality overturning of that regulation. Um, again, this, these are the big ticket regulations, but economically significant means 100 million impact, either cost or benefit. Um, so some of this could be deregulatory initiatives. So I think there's, there's no doubt that the flow of new regulations has declined dramatically in this administration. And that, I think, is something you, you hear people talk a lot about um, businesses are more optimistic because of taxes and regulation. I think this is what they're talking about, that their um, businesses may be less concerned that new regulations will be coming down the pike with which they'll have to comply. But he's claimed more than that he's going to slow down the flow. This is a year and a half ago where he, um, he's got a stack of the code of federal regulations. So while that the federal register pages are new rules each year, this is the stock of existing regulations. And he's down on the left side of the picture is the number of pages in that code in 1960, and on the right side is the pages in that code today. So he stood there with golden scissors and snipped that, saying that he was going to cut back to these 1960 levels. So that's what I'd like to talk about now. Is he, because if you're going to deconstruct the administrative state, it's one thing to move ahead at a slower pace, it's another altogether to get back to 1960 levels. All right. So um, he's, several initiatives that I want to talk about. The, the first one is um, within the first few weeks of taking office in January um, 2017, he issued Executive Order 13771, which did two things. First, it said for every new regulation agencies issue, they have to find two to rescind. The second was a, a constraint on added costs of regulation. And he said um, agencies needed to stay within an incremental regulatory budget, so they couldn't add costs. Um, so the first year they set that at net zero, so that any new cost they had to offset by finding regulations to modify or rescind. Um, and in subsequent years, each agency is setting it, but it's less than zero. So they're actually trying to reduce the cost. Now, the two for one is what you hear a lot about, but that's actually not going to be the binding aspect of this constraint, because the way it's been interpreted is that agencies can remove um, smaller, a small regulation and trade it for a big one. So I was um, discussing this with someone who said, this is ridiculous. It's like saying every time I buy a new suit, I have to clean two old suits out of my closet. And I said, well, it's not exactly that. You could get rid of two socks and buy the new suit. So that first one is not binding. And in fact, that's what you've, we've seen. Um, I have some statistics in a second. The second one, on the other hand, is the more binding because that really that says you can't impose incremental costs, new costs, without finding some way to offset the costs. And that doesn't have to be done by getting rid of things. So the two for one, you have to actually rescind, get rid of the regulation. To offset the costs, agencies can do it by modifying streamlining reporting requirements, et cetera. And that's a lot of what we've seen, um, is the, the regulations that are being, um, the, the, to offset the costs, we are seeing more of that. Can we do this in a more effective way? Can we do it without quite the same amount of reporting burdens, et cetera? So um, this is the second executive order that he issued. Um, within the first couple months of office. And at first when I saw it, I, I thought, well, that, it seemed to me that it was a big yawn. But what it does is it requires every agency to have in the agency a regulatory reform officer and a team, of who, who this person heads a team that's responsible for identifying ways to reduce regulatory burdens. And since agencies already have a regulatory review officer, I didn't 
I think I just didn't realize the importance of it, but I actually think it's, it is important because agencies, um, I mean, if, if you have ever studied public choice or politi political economy, agencies tend to, um, you get rewarded by thinking of the next important thing that you can fix. And that's rarely looking back to see whether existing regulations are working. It's usually some problem that you can solve with new regulations. So creating a team whose sole, who are going to get evaluated based on whether they can find things to do more cost effectively or more efficiently, I think actually has changed things a little bit in the agencies. So um, last fall, OMB came out with a report on their activities to date. And they said that in that first year and a half, they had issued 234 or taken 234 deregulatory actions compared to only 17 new regulatory actions. Um, and it, that it resulted in more than $2 billion in savings. Now, um, this is again where you have to have that caveat that those 234 deregulatory actions, it could be a guidance document or um, they could be very small regulations that are used to offset. Um, and some people have criticized um, OMB for that. So the office in OMB that oversees that is the one that put the guidance in place that allowed that. But I actually think that they did a nice job of taking a campaign trail promise because I don't know if you remember, but the, pre the Trump on the campaign trail talked about this two for one, one in, two out. And so in order to do that, I think they did it in a way that allows agencies to, to comply with what the president said, but do it in a way that is um, more practical. So I think what we have seen is that we've seen a lot of those things that are, are the smaller items that have been those deregulatory actions. And, but we haven't seen wholesale change of big existing regulations. And that makes sense. In two years, it would be very hard to do that. I don't know if you're familiar with the process for issuing regulation, but um, under this, since 1946, agencies have had to first um, uh, the, put the, um, put the proposal out for public comment. So the Federal Register puts it out for public comment, receive comment, revise the regulation based on that comment. They also have to increasingly build a record so that it doesn't get overturned in court. And since 1981, they have to go through interagency review of their significant regulations. All those different steps take time. And in two years, I'm not surprised at all that we haven't seen agencies put together the package to actually unwind um, existing regulations. Instead, what we've seen for the $2 billion in annual savings and those 234 deregulatory actions are things like what they have found in other countries. So the United Kingdom had a one in, one out that they then made it one, um, one in, two out, and then finally one in, three out. And what they did find with that process is that rarely were they actually changing regulatory outcomes. It was more changing the procedures, the steps to get there. So paperwork burdens, reducing paperwork burdens, streamlining things. So perhaps that's what we're seeing here. All right. So. These are my calculations in the first two years. So looking, um, when I was showing you those graphs, that doesn't distinguish between actions that are regulatory or deregulatory, it was just numbers. Um, the way they achieved some of the deregulatory actions, um, the first year, it was with the help of Congress. So Congress issued 14 resolutions disapproving Obama. Um, regulations issued towards the end of the Obama administration. And if you're interested in that, that's the Congressional Review Act. I'm happy to talk more about that. And then they subsequently did one more resolution of disapproval for one of a regulation issued during the Trump administration. Um, so by signing those resolutions of disapproval and not vetoing them, he was able to, with a stroke of a pen, or at least one stroke of his pen, get rid of 17, 15 regulations. Um, of the 57 major regulations that have been issued in the first two years, 
19 are classified as deregulatory, 11 is regulatory, and 27 are exempt or other. Um, so, so that's sort of what, what we've seen and what they've done. Um, they've also, in the first two years, faced significant court setbacks. And I've seen Jonathan cited a lot in the media about this. Jonathan, someone they often will get quotes on about that. Um, the Institute for Policy Integrity at NYU School of Law did some calculations, and they found that of 30, 36 cases that have gone to trial of, of Trump administration actions, 34 of them they've lost, and only two of they won. Um, I'd be curious what you think of how, I think the way they count, there, there are different ways of measuring those things. But, um, and some of that was just extensions of deadlines. You know, so they it would extend a deadline for, for compliance without going through notice and comment. Those are things they, they just lose. Um, so it, it shows you that even though they even with the actions they've taken, it's not clear that they are having long term success. But also, if your goal is to get back to nineteen sixty levels, which he says we're gonna do pretty soon, nineteen deregulatory actions barely makes a dent in that. And it, one thing I find very interesting and um, is because people are very concerned that the Trump administration is just approaching regulation completely differently than previous presidents. Since 1993, well, since, nine, since Jimmy Carter, presidents have required agencies to understand the benefits and the costs of regulation before issuing them. Um, and the Trump proposals you see are mostly focused on the costs. But I think very significantly, he has not abandoned the requirement to do benefit cost analysis. So President Clinton's executive order issued in 1993 is still in place. So when you think about that, that's pretty remarkable. Because an executive order, unlike a regulation, an executive order can be eliminated with the stroke of a pen. Um, but we've had, so after Clinton, we had um, George W. Bush, Obama, and now Trump. So if you, it's hard to think of three presidents with more different regulatory philosophies than that trio, and yet they've all kept these, these procedures um, and these requirements. They've, so part of that is this benefit-cost analysis. The other is that office that Jonathan mentioned, the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs, which oversees agencies' um, regulatory actions. And I'd love to talk more about that if you're interested. So one thing required by President Clinton's order and which is still in place is first identify what the compelling need is and regulate only once you've done that. Second, look at different ways of regulating. Third, maximize net benefits. That requires you not just to look at the costs, but to look at the benefits. And then fourth, consider distributional impacts. So the way I look at it, what Trump has done is he has not abandoned that, but he's put this budget overlay on top of it. So he's requiring to regulate within a budget, but still each individual regulatory action is subject to this net benefit test. And I can tell you the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs, which is staffed by career um, most uh, economists, policy analysts, lawyers, um, is quite serious about that. So I mean, they they think that's important. So I think that incremental overlay um, is something to keep in mind. So going forward, so I, I said the last thing I was going to talk about is 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 what he's doing historic and what does that mean? So there are a lot of challenges ahead. Um, I think I should start by saying there's no way he'll get back to the 1960 levels. When you think of the number of regulatory agencies that were, have emerged since then. Back then we didn't have an EPA, a Department of Energy, an Occupational Safety and Health Administration, FDA, well we did have an FDA, consumer products, so all the big regulatory agencies weren't in place. So there's legislation that requires agencies to issue regulation. Um, but also they face challenges, as I mentioned, they have to develop the supporting analysis to defend the regulation um, through, no, through public comment and in the courts. And so that requires a careful both legal and 
kind of policy economic analysis that has to be done that justifies the change. And it's, it's challenging when they get to the bigger cases. It's even more, as, as you know, we are very litigious in this country, and a lot of regulation gets litigated. You know, it, there's always someone who's not satisfied with it, and they can bring a suit against the agency. For these, for regulations that are reversing or modifying existing regulations, it's going to be even more challenging because the court is going to have two records. The one record that the agency used to promulgate the regulation in the first place, and then now you have a new record that contradicts that. The deference that courts give to agencies, which one are they going to defer to? So I think there are added challenges um, for these deregulatory initiatives. Another thing that challenge they haven't didn't have a lot in the first few years was congressional oversight, and they certainly will now. You know, the House certainly plans to um, focus on regulatory activity, and there'll be a lot of oversight there. And also, the Congressional Review Act starts to be binding so in mid mid year next year. So he doesn't have until. January 19th, 2021, to finish up, wrap up his regulatory activity because regulations issued in about the last six months of his administration will be subject to the next Congress and the next president, assuming it's a Democratic Congress and a Democratic president, um, rescinding the things that he did. Um, also, there, there's a lot of interest group pressure um, and you know, you, you can see that in renewable fuel standards. EPA had initially said that they were not going to set the renewable fuel, sta fuel um, the standards that um, renewable fuels get blended into gasoline at as high a level as, um, as they could. And then they immediately got um, pushback from Midwestern states. I don't know if Ohio would be in that category or not, but Iowa in particular, um, which you may not know this, but Iowa Pay, plays an outsized role in the president in presidential you know nominate in processes so what what Iowans care about does matter um, so very quickly the head of EPA and the president backpedaled on that so so interest group pressures are going to affect things I mean one of the recent ones was almond milk and soy milk there's concern that um, people won't understand that they don't come from cows and therefore they shouldn't be allowed to be called milk um, that kind of thing that you, there's there's pressure that they shouldn't be allowed to be in the dairy case and they shouldn't be allowed to be called milk. And so we may see regulations to that effect. Um, coal, um, coal-fired power plants, their efforts to subsidize them to keep them going despite what you know market forces and technological developments are, are kind of pushing them out. But anyway, um, we, we've got interest group pressures, and certainly this administration is not immune to them. On the other hand, so I'm going to end on a more positive note. I think there is um, potential for good outcomes with this. Um, agencies, regulatory agencies, and if you look at how their budgets are focused, it really is focused on what is the next problem to solve and the next regulation to um, that issued. Agencies rarely look back to see whether their regulations are having the intended effect. Um, and it's in contrast to their on-budget programs. So if you look at where the, the evaluation offices are in agencies, they're always focused on the on-budget programs because they have to defend that when they go back to Congress to get, um, to get funding. Um, they need to have some evidence that their program is working. That's not true with regulations. Regulations, they tend to put them in place and then they move on and we rarely look back to see. And I've always said that there are two reasons for that. One is that it's hard to do. We don't really have the tools for looking at regulation. It's much, you can't tell what the budget cost is because the costs are more dispersed and harder to measure. But it's also this incentive problem that I talked about earlier. These, the president's orders have try to change that incentive problem and maybe it will shift some resources and force evaluation of whether the regulations are really working as intended. And if it does that, and if agencies focus on maximizing the benefits 
within some, the budget constraints that they've set for themselves, we actually might see a much a more effective and efficient regulatory system, but that is a lot of ifs. So I'll put up some of my propaganda and all right, we have um, on the, uh, some time for questions. I'm going to take the moderator's prerogative and ask uh, a few questions to start. Um, uh, the individual that held your posi the position you held at OIRA uh, for the first years of the Obama administration, Naomi Rao, was recently confirmed to the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit. Uh, in her place, the administration has named an acting administrator. And I don't believe has yet announced that uh, it would be intent to nominate uh, mm -hmm. Paul Ray to be administrator. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about how having an acting administrator as opposed to a Senate confirmed administrator affects the ability of the White House to control or steer regulatory agencies. And perhaps as part of that, say a little bit about the interagency review process, because that's something that occurs behind the scenes in the development of regulations that often doesn't get a lot of mm -hmm. press attention and is, is not as transparent as some other aspects of the regulatory process. Yeah, I, that's great. And I think maybe I'll do a little background on what OIRA is so the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs and its staff of O-Iranians. Um, so it's a small staff, about 50 people, um, civil servants, um, headed by a political appointee um, that requires Senate confirmation. Um, they've been around since they were created, actually Jimmy Carter created them um, when he signed the Paperwork Reduction Act, but it was Ronald Reagan. He did, Carter did that at the very end of his term. So it was Reagan who set up the office and gave it this responsibility for, um, for overseeing regulations. They oversee all significant regulations of executive branch agencies. So that, you know, the Department of Energy, the Environmental Protection Agency, they don't oversee the Securities and Exchange Commission. So the multi-headed um, commissions they don't oversee. Um, their, their review, I like to think of them as wearing several hats. So one is um, that, that I mentioned the things that were in President Clinton's executive order, the regulatory analysis requirements. So one is kind of that green eye shade role of evaluating the regulations, evaluating the regulatory impact, and, and trying to ensure that the agency used the best evidence that they had and chose the best alternative, the one that maximized net benefits. Um, a second is that they, as Jonathan mentioned, they coordinate across different agencies. And that's really valuable. So Cass Sunstein is a Harvard law professor who had held the position before Naomi and after me. Um, and he, he has, he's written several books about, I mean, he writes several books um, faster than I can read books, but several that he talks about that interagency review and just how important that is to make sure that uh, the government, that the left hand of the government knows what the right hand is doing. Um, a third hat that they wear is that they are part of the executive office of the president. So it's a career staff that is part of the White House, essentially. And that does mean that they also, um, they, they try to make sure that the president's policies, the elected president's policies and goals are implemented. Um, so that's kind of an interesting mix of things that they do. And sometimes those things, there's some friction between them. But surprisingly, at least in my experience, I was on that, in that office on the career staff um, and in the 80s and then um, obviously as the head of the office um, in the George W. Bush administration. Um, so Jonathan's question, so what happens when that political head is there? So you've got this staff of 50 career staff who've been there through many different administrations, and they're all, they're, does it mean that the president is less likely, less able to keep control over his agencies? I think, yes. I think it's difficult. I think there's often a long period. There, are, in OIRA's history, there are long transitions with no politically appointed administrator. Um, in fact, in the entire George H. W. Bush administration, there was no political administrator. It was an acting career administrator the whole time. Um, it's one of those offices that, unlike the Secretary of Treasury or the head of OMB, which Congress realizes we've got to confirm this person, it's an office that maybe doesn't rank as high in, in, I don't know why, I think it should be the top criteria of Congress, but it tends not to be. 
Um, and also, it's one of those offices that doesn't really have a constituency because it makes everybody mad. You know, because you know they're um, because they really do that that cross cutting perspective, which I think is so valuable. Because each agency tends will have their perspective. They'll have the special interest groups that they work closely with, and they'll have their tunnel vision. And it's it's able to step back and look across agencies. So just like other parts of OMB, you know, OMB every agency wants a bigger budget. And the budget examiners at OMB are there to say no. I said when I was at OIRA, that was my job. It was the black hat. I was the one that was there to say no. Um, so without that person, I think it is um, uh, it, its role may be diminished. And one thing that makes me a little bit nervous about that is it means other parts of the White House may have more strength. So presidents have um, a, a big White House team. They'll have, they, so there's a domestic policy council, an economic policy council, um, a council of environmental quality, um, the uh, council of economic advisors. All of those are very interested in play in the regulatory space. Most of them have a similar cross-cutting perspective that OIRA has, but some don't. For example, there's a, I forget the name of it, but the, there's a council for trade. And that's headed by somebody who doesn't have a cross-cutting perspective, but has a very um, focused, narrow vision of what trade should be. So to the extent that those people are influencing regulatory policy, um, yeah, I, I think maybe it means we'll get less, good, less quality regulation. One other question. You mentioned that OIRA traditionally has not exercised its oversight and control of independent mm -hmm. The various boards and commissions, the SEC, FTC, National Labor Relations Board, uh, I guess the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, yeah. although currently that's headed by the same <laughs> person who's the head of OMB and the White House Chief of Staff. So, so it might not matter that they're not under OIR. I think he's. I think they finally have someone here, yeah, so but, he's out. Yeah. But uh, uh, these commissions are significant regulatory entities, mm -hmm. and I'm wondering, does this mean that the White House has no influence on these agencies? It has a little bit, uh, and and there has certainly was talk beginning of this administration of trying to assert White mm -hmm. House authority over uh, some of these independent agencies, I think the SEC in particular, uh, perhaps some others. And I'm wondering, is that something that could be done, should be done? Uh, how should we think about the role of OIRA and, and White House control of regulatory policy vis-a-vis -vis the independent agencies that obviously have a large regulatory responsibility? So. Um, this is my opinion. I think it could and should be done. Um, I, the people who've done analysis or looked at the independent regulatory agencies and the executive branch agencies, the executive branch agencies always have um, better analysis supporting their regulations than the independent regulatory agencies do. Um, and so I'm not a lawyer. I did we? I don't know if we established that, but I'm not a lawyer. So I, I would defer to uh, probably all of you in this room about how what how the president would have to do that. Um, but I'll, I can tell you that President Reagan, when he for issued the first executive order that gave OIRA this oversight, he considered making including the independent regulatory agencies. And in fact, there was a young staffer in the Office of Legal Counsel who authored a. a um, an opinion that said that he could, and that young staffer's name was Cass Sunstein. Um, that, but he chose not to because he was already doing something that was going to stir things up, and it did. You know, there was a lot of controversy about this, the first executive order. Um, so he chose not to. Apparently, President Clinton also considered when he issued, rescinded Reagan's and issued his executive order, he also considered, and again, chose not to, um, and part of the concern has been that the legislative branch thinks of those independent agencies as theirs, as opposed to the executive branch. Um, this administration, if ever there was an administration that wouldn't, that would just try it, I would think it would be this administration. There's been a lot of talk that there will be an executive order that brings them in. Um, as to the how, I think it would have to be treated a little bit differently than, so, OIRA can, OIRA reviews a regulation and when it's done, it concludes 
it can either it can send the regulation back to the agency if it doesn't meet the requirements of the executive order. It rarely does that, but there is a lot of back and forth with agencies to get to the stage where OIWA won't send the isn't going to send the regulation back. For an independent commission, what they might do is before the commission has voted, have the regulation come over, OIRA would review it, and if OIRA did send the rule back, the commission could override that. That's the way the Paperwork Reduction Act works. OIRA reviews any information collection, including those associated with regulations from all agencies. So I think that kind of a model might work. And one last question before, before we turn to the audience. Um, in your experience, well, looking at the Trump administration's uh, regulatory initiatives, it certainly seems that some agencies have worked more quickly than others. Some have been more legally careful than others. Some have had a better record in court than others. I assume that also means that some play well with OIRA better than others. And I'm wondering if you could, could share a little bit about, in your experience, which regulations or which regulatory agencies are easier or more difficult to influence and control from the executive branch and what sorts of implications that has? So um, these are, now I'm getting into personal stories, but my husband in the Bush administration had the role of head of the policy office at EPA and there may be few more contentious relationships than the head of OIRA and the head of the policy office at EPA. And we survived. We celebrated our 32nd wedding anniversary a couple of weeks ago. Um, so, so that is one. Um, although I think probably less so in the Bush administration than I've talked to um, the administrators who served in the Obama administration and they said that was a very challenging relationship. Um, challenging in the sense that um, they thought that EPA's policies were able to override what they thought were the requirements of the executive order, which every president has agreed are the right rules, tools. It's just they, they interpret them, I guess, a little bit differently. Um, in my day, so my day was after, it was in the Bush administration after 9-11. So the Homeland Security regulations were very challenging because there were White House offices, um, there was a the Department of Homeland Security that any regulation that they wanted to issue would prevent the next 9-11. So if that was the benefit, how could I possibly worry about you know, infringements on privacy or people's time waiting at airports and getting frisked you know, because the benefits were uh, incalculable. Um, so that was the Department of Home, and then there was a Homeland Security Council. So the White House counsel that was responsible for them had that same narrow focus that didn't weigh you know, the trade-offs. Um, so I had, for me, I think a lot of the challenges were there. Um, we have question, uh, time for questions. Please wait for the microphone uh, to come around just because we are uh, recording this and we want to make sure we get the question as well. I think we have one right here. Thank you. How much additional time does the OIR review add to the regulatory process? And is it looking at everything from the notice of proposed rulemaking to revisions all the way through? Yeah, so it, um, on paper and on average, at, so yes, they review the, both the proposed regulation and then after the agency gets public comment and revises it, they'll review the final regulation. Um, on average, the review is 45 to days, I think, 45 to 60 days. Um, but sometimes it's really short. You know, if there's a statutory deadline, the review might be two days. Um, and sometimes it's really long. So there's supposed to be a limit of 90 days. So it's a 90-day review is what they get. And then it can be extended for 30 days at the request at, at the at the OMB can extend it for 30 days. The agency can also extend it. And the way lawyers have interpreted this, the language of the executive order, and this is something a lot non-lawyer can't quite understand, is that if the agency asks for the extension, it's indefinite. So that means there are some regulations that stay that are re under review for over a year. Okay. 
Um, if you see that, and you can see what's under review there. M one thing about OIRA, it's very transparent. So the deliberations are not, I mean, those are governmental deliberations and you can't, you don't know what, who's saying what about the regulation, but you, you can, they have a website that you can see what's under review and when, and if people come in from the outside to meet on it, that's tracked. Um, so if you see something that's been under review for months and months, there's something going on there. There's some friction between the agency and OIRA, and maybe they're doing some more analysis. Um, maybe they just, they, um, the agency may just think, well, if we just let it stay there long enough, they'll be embarrassed and we'll get our way. So um, it's interesting to, but you'll, odds are you won't know. Even after they conclude review, you, they will give you a red line of the, the rule, the draft that came in for review, and then the final draft that was cleared for publication. But you can't tell who made what changes. So this could be part of interagency review and that another agency said, egads, what you're doing completely contradicts what we're doing, or it could be someone in the White House. Um, so you, you can't tell whom is making what change. And sometimes it's the agency itself that may have, re that OIRA may have asked a question, they realize, oh, wait a minute, and they go back and make some changes. So if I go in to meet with the head of OIRA to complain about a rule, yeah. that gets reported and that gets published on the website. Yeah. If I go and meet with someone at, say, the Domestic Policy Council and tell them, gosh, OIRA is not, is gonna let this terrible rule yeah. from the Department of Transportation go through, you need to make sure OIRA stops it. And then they go and meet with OIRA. Does that get reported? Doesn't get reported. Or if you went, you know, say you were a farm interest and talked to the Department of Agriculture, then they would be, yes, that wouldn't be reported. Would, would, would the Department of Agriculture's meeting with OIRA be? No. So, so, the, so the meetings that get reported are outsiders outside meeting with OIRA. Yeah. But not outsiders necessarily meeting with other parts of the government that, that may try and influence them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, and so when I was head of OIRA, White House counsel felt strongly that we shouldn't get around that requirement. So they required other parts of the White House. They said you can't have meetings with people when a regulation, you know, if, so, if they want to come in, they have to do it through the transparent procedure. But there's no requirement for that. So I don't know now whether you could meet with the trade folks or the Domestic Policy Council. And I should just, that's one, and I mean, this may be too much in the weeds, but OIRA doesn't meet with people outside the government except when a regulation is under review and then they will hold a meeting. The agency is always invited. Most agencies come um, and they will record the fact of the meeting. And if you bring any materials, that will be posted on their site, but there's no transcript taken. So it's kind of interesting to look, because there's a calendar, you can just click on the meetings. They call them 12866 meetings for that executive order. And you can see who came. Which, one, one interesting thing about that is that if you are a lawyer with clients, if you see your competitor in their meeting, you've got to get in there and meet, so it may build up the number of meetings that OIRA has. But if I go in to meet with the head of OIRA about this Department of Transportation regulation, the Department of Transportation will be informed that I have requested that meeting, and they will have be the invited. opportunity to show mm -hmm. up. Yep. Okay. Yep. I was just wondering. Wait for the microphone, please. Oh, sorry. Um, in, in the news about the FAA and Boeing, is any part of that problem regulatory? Um, what yes. they're doing or not doing? Can yes. you walk us through yes. that a little bit? Um, FAA, it's, it's such a different, you know, it is a little bit different, but yes, FAA does. Um, they're definitely a regulator, and they issue their regulations through notices and um, that seek public comment, et cetera. Things like this, where you pull air, pull a type of plane out of the sky, that's an emergency action that doesn't go through all those regulatory steps. Well, what about but, the, the alleged relationship, cozy relationship yeah. between Boeing and, and the FAA? Is that subject to this regulation, or deregulating, or? You know, I don't know enough the details, but there often are um, regulations tend to confer can confer competitive advantage on one party over another, and so regulated parties, you know, the kind of the common wisdom is, oh well, regulated parties want deregulation; they don't want a new, they don't want regulations, but it's the public interest that the regulations are in. 
often it is regulatory parties because they're they're sophisticated. They have um, they're sophisticated, knowledgeable about the regulations, and they they stand to gain. Um, whereas the costs of the regulation are dispersed and borne broadly. So the economic theory of regulation is just that. And I, I, don't, I shouldn't say just that because I don't know what was going on with Boeing and FAA, but is that the, the big players will be the ones that influence the regulation, um, the form of the regulation in particular, so that it s serves their um, competitive, it gives them a competitive advantage. So nice to hear this discussion. I actually work on regulations for USDA, and so this process is very familiar. Um, on the agency side, when we do a regu as soon as we start regulatory action from like the work plan on, we keep a record of anyone we meet with that comes to us to talk about the topic area. We're not allowed to discuss with them what our deliberations are. And we make a record and we put it in the administrative record. If we rely on any of it, we're supposed to put that in the preamble. And we also say where the administrative record can be inspected. So it's not as transparent as putting it on the website, but we do try to keep track of all such things, at least at you know the naive staff level we do. Yeah, and that's important. So one of the reasons that OIRA is that transparent is that you at USDA, when you're writing a regulation, you are the repository of the record that it will be based on. So if you have some other agency m making some decisions, that then your record isn't valid. And so that's why OIRA feels pretty strongly that it oh, it's, it's your regulation, and that's why you're always invited, and that anything that gets put, that gets given to OIRA is, is given to you to make part of the record if you consider it. What about an agency that's not promulgating the regulation but yeah. thinks it has a real interest? So let's say it's a Department of Transportation regulation, I'll keep picking on them, that will affect the fuel efficiency of vehicles that are regulated by the Department of Transportation. I could see the Energy Department caring about that. I could see the Environmental Protection Agency caring about mm -hmm. that. If, if beyond the interagency review process, do agencies that have a, a claim that something is also within their responsibility have any s special claim in the process? Do they get invited to the OIR meetings too? Or do they just have to use the interagency process as aggressively as they're able to? Um, you certainly, if you look at the, the list of who comes, you will see other agencies there. So yes, often those agencies will know because they've also maybe been in contact with them. But yes, and in one thing I should have mentioned, I think, especially with David here, is that the Small Business Administration Office of Advocacy is very active. So you will almost always see them involved. So they're active in the regulatory interagency review process um, in almost every regulation to the extent that it might affect small entities. So um, they almost always attend those meetings with people from the outside. As I understand it, one of the fundamental problems of regulation is determining the benefit in uh, articulating it or calculating it. Um, and I think Sunstein tried to do something in that regard. But um, uh, if you have the cost on one side and you don't have any, you just got to good feelings on the other side, uh, how do you do any kind of judging? And, and inherent, and I think in all the, the reforms that uh, were sought by Trump's administration, it has in mind somehow a cost-benefit uh, analysis. Yeah. Um, people often say that benefits are harder to measure in, than costs, and in some, I mean, often they are. But agencies have gotten so much better since the Carter administration when they were first required to do that analysis. So that EPA is, um, for example, they've been doing it for a long time and they, can, they quantify a lot of the benefits. What the requirements are is that you quantify both the costs and the benefits to the extent that you can and then you weigh qualitatively the other things. So if you had qualitative benefits, um, 
to, to cost. It doesn't mean it's zero to whatever the cost is. It, the qualitative benefits get weighed in, even if they can't be quantified. Um, agencies have tools like break-even analysis. So this was something that would happen with some of the Homeland Security regulations when the concern was um, bioterrorism affecting the food supply. They were able to do some break-even analysis where they said, well, we know the costs of requiring food produce to be tracked from beginning to end. We know what that is, you know, through the food chain. We know what that is, and we know that there's certain amount of accidental contamination of food. So if the benefits of reducing that through this, um, we know that compared to the cost, could the terrorist, you know, the purposeful contamination of the food supply, is it a lot more or not? You know, is it when we know what the difference is? So there are a lot of ways that agencies do that. Um, and also I think it is true that for things that there's a compliance cost, it is easy to say, well, if you have to put this smokestack on your plant, that's a cost, we can quantify that. But there are a lot of costs that aren't that easy to measure. So again, in the Homeland Security area, what is the cost of making you go through the scanners and you know the, the added burdens of air travel? Those are the kinds of things that are difficult on both sides of the equation. And what the requirements are is just do the best you can and then discuss qualitatively what you can't. We have time, I think, for one or two more questions. I'll come up with lots more. It's over here, here and then there. Thank you for your wonderful talk. I would like to go back to the cost-benefit test. Before we quantify the benefit, could you probably generalize as much as is possible um, whose benefits are we talking about? So um, benefit cost analysis is intended, there's kind of an assumption um, called the Calder-Hicks um, that the assumption is that if the beneficiaries could compensate the payers, do um, that's that's is that a that's a Pareto optimal improvement? So there's this some this assumption that there's compensation, even though we know we they can't. So there's in addition to the benefit cost test, which is really it's economic efficiency. Is this the best way we can achieve this? It um, so that part of the regulatory analysis doesn't consider distribution, but regulatory impact analysis and I should have said it more here because I should say it every time, is so much more than just benefit cost analysis. So there is an explicit requirement to look at who pays and who's receiving. So the distributional impacts can be very important. So of course some regulations, their whole purpose, like food stamp regulations, the whole purpose is to distribute to people who need it from tax, who, from taxpayers. So some, that's the whole purpose. But even if it's not the purpose, it's important to understand. So a regulation that had um, large benefits and moderate costs, but the costs were all borne by disadvantaged people and the benefits by the wealthiest, that's not a regulation that would pass the test. So there's the regulatory impact analysis um, my predecessor at OIRA in the Clinton administration likes, and she's a lawyer, so this is probably, um, she says it's not dispositive. It's informative, but not dispositive. So the analysis is done, but that doesn't force a decision. It's policy makers that are making decisions. So I like to think of it as a requirement to lay out to the extent you can what you know about the good things and the bad things that might happen of the alternative you've chosen as well as other alternatives. And I think in that sense it informs decisions and is um, better than any other alternative we've come up with. Thanks for coming. Uh, to what degree is it a regulatory attitude unique to Donald Trump uh, or simply adopted Republican uh, Party orthodoxy? So Trump or the Republicans? Yeah. Um, uh, Trump, I mean, he certainly puts things in different language. <laughs> um, I think that there has, I think it is, it's more conservative libertarian thought, which is more associated with the Republican Party, that things, we've gone too far with regulation. Um, not that there shouldn't be any, but that maybe we've, we're getting to the point where 
it's burdening our economic growth and prosperity. Um, but it is not exclusive to the concerns about regulation. Oh, and in fact, um, I will point you to something I wrote for the um, Penn Regulatory Review. I looked at um, milestones of regulatory reform going back. Yeah, there it is. A brief history of regulation and deregulation. I'd like uh, students to Oh, really? Oh, good. Um, but if you go back, you'll see that presidents, this, regardless of party, there's been this interest in making sure that um, we're achieving desired goals while minimizing costs. And um, Carter, in, in the back of this, I have a nice quote. He says, the nation must recognize that regulation to meet social goals competes for scarce resources with other national objectives. Priorities must be set to make certain that the first problems addressed are those in which regulations are likely to bring the greatest social benefit. So this is a net benefit test. Admittedly, this is an ideal that can never be perfectly realized, but tools like the regulatory budget so here's Carter talking about a regulatory budget back in 1980. Tools like the regulatory budget may have to be developed if this ideal is to be approached. Um, also probably relevant to that is one of my um, other, my, my, this is, I go through five milestones. Um, one is economic deregulation. There was bipartisan support, um, bipartisan support across all three branches of government that reduced the regulations that were, um, you know, be before 1960, the type of regulation, the economic regulation that regulated prices and quantities and who could fly where. Um, that type of regulation, there was a, a increased awareness that it actually ended up harming consumers and benefiting the regulated parties. Um, and so there was um, broad support for outright deregulation that you're less likely to see that support for environmental regulations. Um, but so I think, so even though it seems quite polarized now, um, it wasn't always that polarized. And even now there are um, Senate Democrats who are very interested in finding way reforms, including can we do a better job of evaluating whether the regulations in place are actually working? So there's a, the Progressive Policy Institute um, has a paper that I think is a nice paper that talks about it like pebbles in a stream. So that each new regulation, you may evaluate it based on benefits and costs and it looks good. You, it, it's like a pebble getting tossed in the stream. And individually, they're not a problem, but it's the accumulation of those pebbles that can block up the screen, stream or the correlate is, is block economic growth. So I think there, it's not, it's, it's less partisan when you get to that. Do we want regulations that work? And is there some way to look at existing regulations and see which ones aren't? Well, I think we're going to end it there. Please join me in thanking Susan for her remarks today. And, um, as always, we have a reception uh, in the rotunda on the other side of this wall. If you need CLD credit and for us to sign up for it, you can sign up there. Uh, I believe next week we have a program on medical records. Is that next the week from Friday, and it's like six hours of CLD credit for those of you trying to load up early in the year. Again, thank you all for coming, and I look forward to seeing you in future programs. <laughs>